I call this message The King and I. I know some of you recognize that as a title of a, of a musical. But the year is 483 BC or BCE if you prefer. As we enter the world of Esther, the book of Esther. And the occasion of the introduction to this Bible book in the first chapter is a state banquet. I'm sure you pick that up. And King Ahasuerus is, is the alliteration of the Persian in the Hebrew, otherwise Xerxes in the Greek. You're talking about one and the same person. He laid on this lavish display and his officials and Dignities would be present at that somewhat lengthy festivity and feasting of six months. I, I suggest that it was staged out because it was such a vast empire. The logistics of getting all the dignities and folks he wanted there were, was a huge task. And so there would have been some present at one time and then others present at another time. And the feasting took place in the luxurious surroundings and the security of Xerxes' palace, which was situated in one of the four chief cities across his vast empire. And this city is called Shushan or Susa. And if you want the modern geography, it was located in the country we know today as Iran. And his empire reached out to the east, so north of India, and the eastern boundary then is where those Stan countries are, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, and, and there, in that direction. And then right across then to the west, to the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Middle East, and then also Turkey, and then from time to time, bits of of, of, of Greece, with whom the empire of the Medes and the Persians, of which Xerxes was king, were in constant conflict over a long period of years. So there were invasions and incursions and land grabbing that, that, that went on between the, the Greeks then uh, and the Medes and the Persians. Now, I've no doubt that at this great state banquet spanning all those months, that the officials and the princes would have gathered together behind closed doors to discuss the, the, the politics of the empire, to discuss military strategy, and no doubt lawmaking. It's well known that the empire of the Medes and Persians, they loved laws, they loved to make laws and then sought to enforce them across the 127 divisions of the empire. Welcome this morning to the empire of the Medes and the Persians. <clears throat> the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, shortly after the time of Xerxes, he, he wrote his histories in several volumes. He, with his descriptions and along with the spade of archaeologists, have actually thrown light on some of the things in this lovely book of Esther, confirming that the writer of Esther knew exactly what they were talking about. But Xerxes himself, and indeed often rulers like him, were ruthless and brutal in their efficiency of government, and they would have systems in place to ensure effective government. It's interesting how when you uh, research and you discover that uh, external sources uh, uncover things that you otherwise might puzzle over. In verse 8 there, it says, In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. And what lies behind that is that in the, in the courts of the kings of the Medes and the Persians, if the king had a banquet or a state event... Then, and there were nobles whom he wanted to humiliate, 
then they were obliged by a law that had been made that if they were offered the king's golden goblet of this sweet, strong wine, they had no option but to drink it, to drink all of it. And of course they became utterly intoxicated and made fools of themselves in their drunken state and so were humiliated at the king's pleasure as they made a drunken spectacle of themselves to all present. And here, Xerxes had introduced a new law. So to rule that out. And that was uncovered by archaeologists. Things that had been written about the time of the Medes and the Persians. And indeed, when King Xerxes, Xerxes was on the throne at the helm of the empire. So there was no compulsion. But it didn't stop the excesses, did it, of the final seven days. You got that, didn't you? That at the, After the 180 days were passed, then there was this special feasting for all the residents of Susa, the capital city, great and small, to come together. And it's at this point, on the seventh day, the proud and somewhat drunken King Xerxes creates a domestic conflict. He sends his seven officials, the seven eunuchs, with an order to his wife and queen, Vashti, and although no direct words go between them, because even the queen could not come and go into the king's presence in those days as she pleased, but nonetheless, without words directly between them, there was, if you like, a row, wasn't there? An argument. And Vashti's putting her foot down. And she says, no, I'm not, I'm not coming. I'm not responding to your order. I do not want to parade with my royal crown on before a drunken rabble of ogling officials to drool over me with lustful eyes. And who of us this morning reading this account would not take sides with Vashti? I certainly take sides with Vashti. She's a strong lady to resist. The consequences could have been dreadful. Indeed, they, they were not good. You know, the tabloids would have had a heyday, wouldn't they, with this story? Vashti refuses to bow to the king's command and decree. Your queen makes a stand on behalf of the women of the empire. You know, that, of course, there was no media like that, of course, but news still had ways of, of getting around. But uh, it's not so far away from our own days, is it really, when you, when you think about it? And the officials that are around Xerxes, they escalate the matter. And so it is another law is passed, which is supposedly to save face and set a precedent for life in the homes across the empire. You know, the, the outwardness of this great, vast empire with all its splendour and wealth, you know, might have caught the eye of, of many people as they came to the palace at Shusha. But you know, there was little love in the royal household, was there? In the king's home and in his heart, there was lust and luxury. He had his harems, he had his ornate palace, he had access to anything that he wanted. There was pomp and pride and lust and pomp and pride and greed things that are much closer to our age, aren't they? Prevalent there to homes, even perhaps have been in our own homes, maybe still are in some measure. What a way, what a dreadful way to treat his wife, don't you think? As if the harem that he kept was not humiliating and demeaning enough he humiliates her further in this way. Xerxes was king, you see. And he could do what he liked. Have what he wanted. And one archaeological dig revealed an inscription to King Xerxes. And on it was written, amongst other things, 
King of Kings. King of Kings. He could set his own boundaries. He could make his own rules. So no compulsion for anybody to drink. Everybody to serve their husbands like gods. He sees himself in that light almost of some kind of, of deity. Who can rightly claim such a title whose laws truly hold sway, whose power is, un- is as unspeakably great as his love? The Bible has a description of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, only he. You know, when I gave this message the title, The King and I, I was thinking about me. I want you to think about you as you listen, searching our own hearts and our own lives, because in many ways, that's exactly the rebellion of men and women against God, isn't it? They don't want God to have the rule over them. They want to be king of their own life. We want to set our own boundary lines, whether that's to do with sexual morality, whatever it's to do with, we want to make our own boundary lines, king of our own lives. I don't think that Zexy's attitude is that much different in that way from anyone else in the world I'm king I don't have anyone else rule over me and I live my life the way I choose thank you very much don't come preaching at me telling me what the Bible says the Bible says husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church Gave himself for her. I think Xerxes could have done with listening to that had the word been spoken in his day. It was a world of violence, callous brutality in that empire, and there's a callous brutality today as well. But you know, the blood. The only blood that was shed, that counts and shed willingly, is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in giving himself that he might be Lord and King of our lives. You see, Xerxes had yet to come to terms with the real King of Kings who reigns forever in an everlasting kingdom. Perhaps we don't like rules. Xerxes made his rules. God has made his rules. Right there in the Bible. Take the Ten Commandments as a framework for that. You know, there are sometimes that people think, maybe even we have thought, that, you know, God's rules are so restrictive and, and you know, they're, they're going to take the joy out of living. But actually, they're the best thing ever because they declare to us a pure and lovely, fulfilling way to live. Now, there were those in Xerxes' empire, indeed in his own city of Susa, who didn't love the Zoroastrian gods of the Persians, the religion that they followed, but they loved and believed in the Lord God who made heaven and earth. And there were two characters in this book, Esther and her cousin Mordecai. They feature here, and they were Jews. And as the account unfolds of this time with Xerxes at the helm in this vast empire with Jews like Mordecai and and Esther scattered across the empire and living in Susa as well, we find there a hatred and prejudice that arises and is maintained against those Jewish people spearheaded by a man called Haman who ends up in a high position of office in Xerxes' 
empire. And it goes into a potential genocide. A plot to exterminate, to wipe out the Jewish people. All of them. And yet, from this very people was to come in the flesh the Saviour who bears the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have to state the end of the account in order to understand and rejoice in God's overruling and God's working out his purposes. For nothing will thwart his purposes. Nothing will prevent his salvation coming to many peoples. And so it is that although this high official Haman seeks to bring about the genocide, the extermination of the Jews, he utterly fails because of God's overruling providence and working in the lives of his people like Esther and Mordecai and even through the somewhat to us at least strange circumstances of Xerxes and the domestic that escalated over Queen Vashti's disobedience. So it is the Jews were spared. Who's behind it? Well God of course. And you won't find a single mention of the name of God in the book of Esther. The writer wants us to understand something. That God is constantly at work behind the scenes of history and events that sometimes befuddle us, perplex us, challenge us. Maybe even a painful for us to live through. You know, but how? How does God bring about the deliverance of the Jews from the evil Haman who wants them wiped out and persuaded the king to get them wiped out. Let me put it to you like this. He does it through a domestic. A row, an argument in the royal couple. Such that King Ahasuerus Xerxes dispenses with his queen and seeks out another queen. Some suggest that Xerxes regretted his decision. The tone of verse 1 of chapter 2, when the wrath of King Xerxes subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done. It was too late. He had made the rule. But God's working, God's preparing someone, namely Esther, to be in that right place in the king's palace, beside him as his queen, in order to thwart, expose and thwart Haman's plot of genocide to which he persuaded the king to agree. Through a domestic, a royal row that might have been spread across the tabloids of the day, so to speak, God works. And even through a sordid selection process for a new queen, You can read it in chapter 2. It's just very distant from what we are accustomed to. This huge selection process in which many were going to be made living widows. There was nothing pleasant about it, even though some of those those young unmarried women may have thought, this is wonderful, you know, it's like a, a beauty contest. It wasn't a beauty contest at all. It was just to satisfy this proud, lustful man, fill up his harem with these one-night stands and then choose one of them to be his queen who still wouldn't have proper access to him. Do you see what the writer is saying? God is at work through the royal domestic row. He's doing something. He's using it. God is at work through the sordid selection process of a queen because Esther is going to be his instrument to deliver the Jews from extermination. And the action of a loyal citizen, Esther's cousin Mordecai, who uncovered a plot to assassinate King Xerxes. And he reported it and it was dealt with. And that had a part to play. 
We'll come to that when we look at Mordecai sometime, where you can read the account. That loyal citizen, his good deed. God used that. And then he used a courageous young queen, Esther. Maybe she was in her late 20s, around there maybe. With encouragement from her cousin Mordecai, who had brought her up. She risks her neck, puts her life on the line in order to see that the Lord might use her and bring deliverance to the Jews, for she herself was a Jew. And so it is that deliverance come, the Jews are spared. And the Lord Jesus, who was promised as the saviour of the world, he comes into the world after the flesh, in the line from the family of Jews. If there's one lesson you take away from this this morning as we've entered the empire of the Medes and the Persians. Remember who actually is in control of all things. Revelation, they cry out and they say, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, they say. The Lord God Almighty reigns. He is in control. Can even use evil men with their evil intents and their ungodly customs to bring about his good purpose. Proverbs 16 speaks about the lot being cast into the lap. And when you read through Esther, and you, you'll come to the chapter where Haman and his evil alliance, they cast lots to determine the day on which they will go out there and massacre the Jewish people. The lot is cast into the lap, Proverbs 16, verse 33, but it is the Lord who determines the outcome. Written all over the book of Esther, is that God is in control of absolutely everything. And if you could write a New Testament verse, apart from hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns, over the book of Esther, I think it would be Romans 8 verse 28, wouldn't it? For God works all things together for the good of those who love him, according to his purposes, working them for good the ultimate outcome because God is in control the ultimate outcome is good something good that gives hope and confidence to God's people to persevere courageously and for us that means to persevere courageously with the gospel in the gospel. Not to fret. Because of opposition. Not to fret. Because of evildoers. God will deal with them. With all. Injustice. But he is just and. Holy. Before Xerxes. Empire of the Medes and the Persians. There was a king before him. There was the em empire of the Babylonians. You're not going back many decades. And Nebuchadnezzar was king. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar came to realise. And he said, Daniel chapter 4 verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? His kingdom lasts forever. It will never be overrun, it will never be overthrown, it will never be extinguished, it will never end. It's not the empire of the Medes and the Persians that we live in at the moment, of course. 
But there are other more subtle empires, aren't there? Under which men live. Secularism. Complete absence of God, driving God out. The kingdom of, of wealth and success and popularity reigns over the lives of so many. It won't last. It won't last. It will come to an end. There's only one everlasting kingdom because there's only one everlasting king. King Jesus. Sometimes God's people are perplexed, much perplexed, by what's going on. We need to remind ourselves that God is in control. We need to take to heart the truth of his promise that he's working out his purposes for the good of those who love him. One day, the Bible tells us, speaking of the believer in Jesus, one day we will know as we are known, it says there in Corinthians. I want to quote to you a mother just so full of, of sorrow, speaking at the funeral of their daughter, who only young was killed in a tragic accident and these are her words quoted in the paper I can't possibly begin to explain the ocean of grief we find ourselves in or the feeling of being shattered into a thousand unfindable pieces the feeling of being shattered into a thousand unfindable pieces Sometimes when we look at the circumstances of life around us, we might feel it just doesn't make sense. But I want to say to you this morning that King Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is in absolute control and will ensure that his promise to work things for ultimate good comes to full fruition. One day... He'll welcome us into his presence forevermore if we belong to him. And then, and perhaps only then, we shall understand that there are no unfindable pieces to the jigsaw of the life of the people of God. We know it then. Take comfort now and walk in trust and persevere.